Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, it's still Wednesday, July the 31st. My guest in this segment is John Farquharson. We're going to be sort of doing a Walt and Jack show. So, John, let's start off with Government Street. Well, Government Street's interesting in that the uh, Mayor Helps was uh, recently commenting on the debate that seems to go cars, no cars, back and forth. And she was talking about her time in Germany and in Heidelberg, I think, where the main street was uh, shared by cyclists, pedestrians, and cars, and the cars, as she said, sort of inched along, so everybody was on the street. And uh, that's one of the decisions that seems to be out there uh, as to whether or not Government Street will, you know, become a, uh, what, she, what the mayor calls a pedestrian priority shared street. And uh, my interest in this is I was involved in a project, well, first of all, the, the term pedestrian priority was basically coined in the Victoria, City of Victoria Greenways plan, uh, you know, back in 2003, and it was where pedestrians would have priority on the street. Uh, not much came of that, but recently it seems to have... And as a pedestrian, I can say we have no priority. There is no priority lower than that of the pedestrian. Well, it's, 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 it's been on the street since, you know, there, there was a recent study, or a recent uh, report came out, uh, 2019 document, it's called Go Victoria, Our uh, Mobility Future. And it says that the... Um, the uh, it says that cycling, walking, and rolling are the most sustainable, accessible, and affordable transportation options available today. And uh, there's a need to focus our infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure accordingly. But when you look at what's involved there, we're talking about people walking dogs, people jogging, using mobility devices, wheelchairs, walkers, strollers. You see the parents jogging with the kids in the strollers. And then rolling includes skateboarding, you know, long bordering, scootering in line, and so on. So there's this huge <clears throat> amount of rolling traffic. And so it's not all going to fit on the sidewalk. So it just seems to me that it's now time to really acknowledge that we want sustainable, we want affordable um, uh, forms of transportation. And the only way to accommodate the ones I've just mentioned seems to be to have some truly shared streets. Not, you know, not keeping the cars off, just that they go slow enough and acknowledge that uh, pedestrians should be, as pedestrians and rolling traffic should be expected and they should yield to them. I think to do all of that, you've got to have a, a sense of respect, right? And uh, in our traffic patterns <coughs> today, um, yes, a lot of people do, but enough don't so that it, it doesn't work. I mean, you can't, I've seen on Government Street, some, some I mean, people shooting down yeah. at high speed on bicycles, weaving in amongst, I mean, it's crazy. You can't have that. So there's got to be rules and there's got to be respect. And, uh, you know, our society seems to be moving in other directions than that. Well, one of the biggest challenges will be to re-educate drivers uh, in cars, since they've always had command of the streets. The streets are for cars and the sidewalks are for people, right? And they're begrudgingly given some of that over to bicycles. But to bring people rolling uh, and uh, otherwise back onto the streets would take a huge education. Uh, it seems to work in Europe. It seems to work yeah, in Europe. Yeah. Why can't it work here on selected streets? So I want to talk a bit about how are decisions made in our city and, uh, you know, big issues like sewage, the bike lanes, uh, the blue bridge, zoning and housing and homelessness issues and how much do we have to pay for housing and how much are rents, all of those kinds of decisions. I've lived in Victoria for about 35 years and I don't think I've ever been asked once what I think or what I want. And when I say I, I don't really mean I, I mean we, we the people who live here. We can go to an open house, and I've gone to many, and many people have, where the professionals who work for the federal, provincial, or city government come and tell us what they have planned for <clears throat> us while pretending that they care about what we have to say, but they don't. And that's the opposite of democracy. And, you know, Think about yourself and your family and your friends and your workmates. Are you ever consulted about the important issues 
that have to do with, with our lives. Yes, we get to vote every four years, but then it turns out that everything they said was a pack of lies and didn't really matter anyways. So how do we, I mean, to me this is not democracy. And to me, democracy is a very, very important thing. So I think we would all be a lot better off if we, the people, started to become more of an important focus and focal point of how decisions are made. And right now, I think, there is a very, very small group of people at the top, the 1% of the 1%. They run our cities, they run our provinces, and they run our country, and they're the ones who tell the politicians what to do, and that is what has to change. A couple of experiences that I've had in terms of, you know, taking back uh, some uh, agency in the open houses. They're great on open houses, but they design the open houses now, particularly more recently, to <clears throat> not provide you with a focal point. You go in, there's an introduction on whatever the topic is, and uh, um, then there's other people who float around the room with poster boards. And the person who's introducing it all has the attention of everybody in the room, and uh, they say, I'm not going to take any questions. Uh, but you can go out and talk to any of the facilitators. So what that does is it divides the large group, and so it disperses the focus, right? So one thing I've learned is put your hand up and say, no, I'd just like to ask one question, please. And they can't say no. And then you ask a question, and somebody else asks a question. So then you have everybody in the room with the one focal and, foc focus. And th that's great. And the next step has got to be that the opposition point of view, that is not the city or provincial point of view, has the opportunity to also get up on the stage and present their point of view to the citizens. But that never happens at our open houses. It's only, well, you know, it's city but, ones that I go to or CRD. And but a step in that direction is, you know, sure, it'd be great if the opposite point of view was given one spokesperson yeah. and they got up there. But that's not going to happen, right? So but the, it should. Yeah, it well, be the most a lot of basic uh, of all things. But in the meantime, before the should happens, uh, I think the name of the game is to go in there and uh, just basically not always obey the rules of the format. Yes, um, and you're absolutely right. Asking that kind of question while everybody is focused you're too, on yeah. too Canadian. In the sewage uh, issues, we we commandeered one of their uh, open houses. We brought in our own poster boards. We were told to remove them immediately, and we didn't. We just how left. How dare they? I mean, really, how dare they? Well, the guy who was asking me to do it was a big, tall guy. He leans over you and you say, "No, we, this is you know, this is some information." The, the poster boards—they're all PR. You know, they're often PR spin, particular point of view, and we provided a, you know an equally factual but alternative point of view. And so when it came time to uh, at the end of the. Uh, uh, walking around the open house, participants, people, you know, citizens were expected to fill out, you know, choice A or choice B. Do you want this? Do you want that? And um, we said there's another option. And here it is, choice three. We just sort of circle around the tables. And the number of people, you know, are you, are you allowed to do that? Yeah. You know, are you allowed to do that? Yeah. Yes. Write in none of the above. Yeah. This is what we want. I know. Anyways. It's, it's a great weakness of ours that we're so nice and, and people allow themselves to be taken advantage of. And, and believe me, the people at the top love that. I'll just finish off this particular topic about how decisions are made by saying on the Blue Bridge issue, which was very, very important for this city, because not only is it costing us like $120 million to build this stupid bridge, which we never needed, but also we lost the rail bridge to downtown, which was a huge loss for the city. But our city council and the city's media lied to us to get us to vote for building a new bridge when we had the chance to vote. They told us that building a new bridge would cost less than fixing the old bridge, but in fact, the old bridge could have been fixed according to the estimates for less than $10 million. We're now at $120 million. And they just do that to us. Nobody ever pays a price. Nobody ever even really knows about it, but that's the way they operate. And if we want to save our lives, because that's kind of the level we're at right now, we have to just get a more democratic process in place. For example, 
the removal well, <laughs> of the... Uh, <laughs> well, the bridge, uh, and then we'll segue into the other one, but the, the bridge is, there was some letters to the editor in the, in the uh, Times Colonist, and I think this one was tongue-in-cheek, but it <laughs> claims that the, the bridge was one of the largest uh, per capita infrastructure uh, uh, investments ever made. So in Victoria? In Victoria, or? because 80,000, yeah. we got some help from uh, you know, senior levels of government, but once it went beyond the budgeted uh, price, then we are responsible for all the cost overruns, and I think we're well north of 100 million now, right? Um, so uh, the, um, they said that this, the Blue Bridge is one of the most costly infrastructure uh, undertakings, uh, either in Canada, I think they, they exaggerated a bit, but you know, it, it maybe in North America, but it is, it was a huge undertaking that we couldn't, 80,000 people or 85,000 people could not afford and didn't have to do. Yeah. The statue? The statue, in terms of decision making. So recently there's been uh, notices, well, we've been notified that, uh, that there'll be five or six uh, education consultation sessions over the next five, six, seven months. Uh, prior to making a decision about the relocation of the Sir John well, A. I hadn't heard a word about that. that yeah. This is the first I've heard. Yeah, so it's, and then sometime in 2020, I'm not sure, early, middle, late, don't know, then the decision will be made. But, about what to do with the statue of Sir John A. Macdonald. Yeah, which yeah. is in storage, and I'm, and I'm thinking it's unfortunate because they, they blew, in terms of, I just think they blew the decision-making process the way they removed it. Now, which was like I done in a very very short period of time. I mean the process was lengthy, but it was behind closed doors. Um, and when they actually did decide to to make the move, you know people had like some of the counselors were quite upset. They only had like two days' notice. It was done in a, you know a, a, you know a late at night or early in the morning, and poof away it went. And what a wonderful opportunity. So anyways, it was, it was uh, something that was done in the dead of night or behind closed doors. And what a wonderful opportunity, because what they could have done is said, we're going to get rid of the uh, statue, and here's why. Give us everybody a week's notice, and we put or together... Or a month's notice? Well, okay, weeks, months' notice, but it's going to be a celebration. Okay, and we're going to turn in the removal into a huge celebration in terms of reconciliation, because no indigenous person should have to walk past Sir John A. Macdonald in order to do business at, at uh, City Hall. It's just not on. It, for me, it's a no-brainer. Statue's got to go. Give it a week, but turn it into a celebration. You would have got thousands of people out there celebrating this kind of one small step in reconciliation. But they, you know, they, just, they blew that process. Could have been a beautiful process. What a wasted opportunity. And now they've, now they've turned something into, now at the other end, I think they're equally got a bungled process. <laughs> yeah, goodness help us. I mean, you know, it's, society is difficult. Last topic is the fight between uh, Alberta and British Columbia over the uh, TMX pipeline. I just want to say that as far as I'm concerned, there is no fight between the people of Alberta and the people of British Columbia over that pipeline. It's, it's a false story. It's the story that's been created by the media and the politicians to get us to fight each other when the real fight is all of us together, the people of BC and the people of Alberta, together against the oil companies that are killing all of us and our families. The people of Alberta, of course, want jobs, and of course they should have that. The people of BC want to protect the environment. The, the common enemy in all of this, I think, is the, you know, in this particular issue, is the oil industry. Let's bring them, but since they own the media, what the media's job, and they own the politicians, so together, the media and the politicians get us fighting each other, while the oil companies remain completely hidden as if they're not involved, when they're really the number one involvement. Or so I think. Okay, we've got like 30 seconds, so I can't begin to unwrap that one, so I'm going to take a pass. Okay. That's why I brought it down to 30 seconds, because <laughs> uh, not everybody agrees with me on that. John, thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.